welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar, TikTok and WeChat, Where To Now? Uh, before we begin proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently sitting, the Ngunnawal peoples. It is upon their ancestral lands that the Australian Strategic Policy Institute is built. As we share our knowledge today, may we also pay respect to the knowledge and traditions of the Ngunnawal peoples. Um, let me also extend my thanks to the United States uh, State Department for their support in funding our paper on TikTok and WeChat, and without whose support we would not have this opportunity to be speaking to these four experts today. Um, and of course, a big thank you to these four ex experts who are uh, joining us from the United States and Canada today. Uh, from Canada, we have Joanna Cho and Dr. Christopher Parsons. And from the United States, we have Lindsay Gorman and Jordan Schneider. So welcome everyone. I'll just quickly run through everyone's bios. So uh, Joanna Cho is a Vancouver-based journalist for the Tor uh, Toronto Star. And she's also the author of an upcoming book called China Unbound which looks at the human rights impacts of China's rise around the world. Um, Joanna has also conducted research on China's social media censorship systems with PEN America and the Committee to Protect Journalists. Dr. Christopher Parsons is a senior research associate at Citizen Lab in the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy with the University of Toronto. Lindsay Gorman is the Emerging Technologies Fellow at the German Marshall Fund's Alliance for Securing Democracy and a consultant for Schmidt Futures. And last but not least, Jordan Schneider is the host of the China Talk podcast and newsletter and an adjunct fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Okay, so we have limited time uh, for these many excellent panelists and there's a lot of ground to cover. So I also wanna make sure that we have uh, include plenty of time for questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with a bunch of questions for all our panelists. And in the final 25 minutes or so, we'll start addressing questions from the audience. So everybody who's watching, please feel free to submit those questions whenever you like. You can begin now if you wish. And for anyone who is new to this platform, Livestorm, as I am, um, you also have the ability to upvote other people's questions. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, so the, the topic of this webinar is TikTok and WeChat, where to now? But before we get to where we're heading, I wonder, if uh, Lindsay, if you could give us a summary of the the roller coaster ride that we've we've had following this story, right from the the beginning with the CFIUS review, um, through to the executive orders from the Trump administration um, to today. Sure. Thanks so much, Fergus, and and thank you to Aspie. It's it's great to be here, and I'm you know particularly happy to to be on this panel with such a such an international and sort of multilateral representation i think as will as will likely surface in this conversation uh democracies working together and and building an understanding of common threats when it comes to authoritarian information platforms uh is really the the key here so just just this event alone i think goes goes at least a, a step in the right direction um in terms of the roller coaster ride, I think you aptly <laughs> describe it with that phrase, um, particularly over the question of TikTok operating in the United States. It's been uh, quite the roller coaster, hard to follow, many Friday night um, decisions and announcements over the last year. Um, and so I'll, I'll try to take take you through some of them, though, of course, I'll, I'll leave out uh, probably a detail or two um, along the way. There have just been so many. Um, but actually, I, you know, I, was, I was thinking about, you know, when did this really start with the questions over TikTok? 
And you know, as, as Fergus mentioned, the the CFIUS review in the United States uh, is is probably the first policy effort. But I'd actually like to take us back several months before that. That started um, in the beginning of 2020. But actually, in the summer of 2019, I think is when analysts and researchers started to raise questions about TikTok, a growing social media platform that was whose, whose owners were based in China, because during the Hong Kong pro-democracy protests uh, in the summer of 2019, what what some people noticed was that whereas on many social media platforms from YouTube to um, to Facebook, to Twitter, there were po- very popular trending hashtag, hashtags related to the pro-democracy protest in Hong Kong. Um, and, but on TikTok, there were almost none of these same hashtags. And in social media, it's very common to have sort of spillover from one platform to another. And, and researchers noticed that not, almost no pro-democracy hashtag um, hashtags were showing up on TikTok. So I think that is when we sort of started to have some suspicions that perhaps this content could be could be suppressed. Um, and of course, one of the things that's really difficult in this type of work, uh, and w- which actually Aspie and Fergus has done a really great job of showing, is, is proving that someone's sort of tinkering with the algorithm behind behind the door because these things are not transparent and it's hard to tell, you know, is the Chinese government preferentially suppressing content related to the Hong Kong protest? I think that was the question in the summer of 2019. So fast forward a few months, um, and this is all from public reporting, an inquiry into TikTok, and in particular, whether it's suppressing content, um, but also what's happening with the data that the platform collects on its users. Um, was initiated, was actually called for by several members of Congress in the United States, uh, Marco Rubio among them, and they requested that the Committee on Foreign Investments in the U.S., uh, also known as CFIUS, look into TikTok and see if its Chinese ownership raises any national security concerns. And for a, a tad bit of context on the CFIUS process and, and CFIUS's interest in, in Chinese data collection platforms, CFIUS had already reviewed um, at least two uh, Chinese-owned or Chinese-associated information platforms operating in the United States and had recommended that they be sold to a U.S. buyer. Uh, and these were a hotel platform called Stay in Touch that managed hotel data and information for for people staying at hotels, uh, and that was recommended to be sold. And then also the the dating app Grinder, which also, in theory, could have potentially sensitive um, information on U.S. persons, that that also was the subject of a CFIUS review. So going into this question with TikTok, CFIUS, CFIUS had already, over the last couple of years, reviewed cases of Chinese information platforms operating in the United States and made a recommendation that, be, that they be sold to a U.S.-owned company so that there wasn't this risk of one, and, and, and primarily this risk of the data being sort of piped back to to the PRC. Um, in, t- in the case of TikTok, there, there are a couple additional things to be concerned about, namely this information suppression that the Chinese Communist Party could preferentially or could ask TikTok to preferentially tweak the algorithm to suppress certain content and highlight other content. So that was sort of the frame going into this, this investigation. And I guess I'll say that, you know, since since that happened, that started around the end of 2019, the early 2020, um, things went very quickly off the rails, um, mostly because the the Trump administration got involved. And uh, whereas what seemed to be, at least from the outside, these CFIUS investigations are, are, are very highly um, sealed and not not of public record. But the investigation appeared to be proceeding, though not in public view. And it looked like, much like the case with, with Grindr and Stay in Touch, CFIUS was poised, perhaps, to recommend uh, a sale. And, and Microsoft had emerged as a potential buyer that would solve, sort of, on, on its face, would solve some of these concerns about, one, whether data would end up 
in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, data on U.S. citizens, um, and two, whether there would be undue influence on TikTok to suppress content or promote content according to the Chinese Communist Party's narratives. Um, so that that sale was on was was in the works perhaps it was it was being talked about it seemed like that might happen um and then sort of enter the former u.s president uh decided that TikTok should be banned in the united states uh, we were undergoing an election season china had become a hot button issue in the united states uh on a political level and there was all there also been some reports of interagency squabbles in the trump administration and the, the former president decided to first issue a verbal warning sort of to TikTok that if it was not sold or if, if it was not dealt with, then it would be banned. And then actually followed it up with an executive with, with, with two executive actions, um, the sum total of which required that TikTok be either sold or dealt with, um, sold to a U.S. provider within a certain time frame, or it would be banned in the United States. Um, and that's sort of when the roller coaster started because there was this deadline of around three months that over the latter half of 2020 got continuously pushed due to challenges in US courts um, from TikTok, from users, uh, as to whether, whether the president actually had the authority to ban an app um, in the United States. And that was that was was something that had was was under litigation. It was not clear what the outcome really would be. In the meantime, the CFIUS process, which was sort of a separate process from the the ban, already getting confusing, which was a separate process from the ban, was still proceeding, but under this very Trumpian style time crunch of you know you're going to be fired if you don't make a deal, and. So then Microsoft seemed to disappear from the picture. A partnership between Walmart and Oracle emerged as a potential buyer, um, which was a little bit strange because as far as, as the public reporting could, could tell, uh, it wasn't actually clear that any of the concerns around data security or information suppression or information influence would really be resolved by the TikTok, Oracle, Walmart deal. Um, and in fact, uh, President Trump and and she, Jinping, got into uh, something of a war of words between the two of them and, and the Chinese propaganda outlets as to who would actually be owning TikTok under this deal with this potential deal with Walmart and Oracle. And, you know, from the United States side, the the, the president said, well, of course, the U.S. would own it. From the Chinese side, uh, the the Chinese propaganda outlet said, well, no, of course, China will still be owning it. And it was entirely unclear as to the, the data assets and the engineering assets, whether they would actually be transferred to U.S. ownership or whether they would stay tied um, to Beijing. At this around the same time, China released a uh, notice of new export controls that said oh, only we can decide uh, if, if a company is going to be sold, that has to be signed off by the Chinese Communist Party um, with, with somewhat curious timing as this was happening. And so the deal really stalled. And it, because it wasn't clear what, what the national security issues would be, that they would be resolved, it wasn't clear what authority Trump had to ban the app in the United States. And more, perhaps most importantly, uh, it wasn't clear if, if China would actually sign off on any deal in the first place. So this really was an example of a, a case where sort of an overreaction, a rhetorical overreaction, perhaps in the press for, you know, maybe for political reasons we don't know, could have actually led to um, a, a reaction from the Chinese side that ended up scuttling uh, this emergent deal. So that is sort of where we, we were as of a couple weeks ago, when um, a month ago, when the Biden administration took office and recently decided, uh, it seems, that they're going to review the situation with TikTok and also uh, now with WeChat, which was also part of one of these executive actions as part of this drama, um, and figure out where they're going to go from here. Um, so that's that's a bit of a long-winded uh, roller coaster story, um, but I think you know one tiny more detail I would add is in the meantime, 
Uh, U.S. allies have also been looking into TikTok for its data security practices, um, including in Europe under Europe's data protection regulator. Australia uh, has has um, raised questions about the practices of the app. So what has has come out as this paradigmatic paradigmatic exemplar in the U.S. China tech battles is actually something. Um, that a number of countries are raising questions about. And so that's why I'm, um, I'm happy to be here today um, and talk with these great experts who've, who've really done wonderful work on this topic. Thank you, um, Lindsay. That was um, a really masterful summary of what really has been um, quite a confusing story to follow. Um, and whenever I've lost my moorings and, and tried to um, uh, regain some sense of where we've been, let alone where we're heading. Um, I always head over to um, your Twitter feed and to the latest articles that you've written about this because uh, you've, you've really done a great job of, of encapsulating that whole very confusing story. Um, but let me, uh, now that we've established that roller coaster ride, I want to take us back to first principles here because um, we're talking about two different apps, WeChat and TikTok. WeChat is um, predominantly an um, instant messaging app, but it's also often common, you know, commonly described as a, a sort of Swiss army knife app, um, especially inside China's borders where it can do um, any number of things, um, help people order taxis and movie tickets, um, and is really an integral part of Chinese people's lives and indeed the Chinese diaspora. And then we have TikTok, which is sort of represents a new breed of Chinese social media app that has, uh, you know, gained mainstream popularity outside of the People's Republic of China. Now, of course, the one thing that, um, uh, that these two apps have in common is that the companies that own and operate them Tencent for WeChat and ByteDance for TikTok are Chinese companies. So let me throw it over to you, uh, Jordan. Um, and, you know, as I said, let's go to first principles here. What is it about these apps that mean that we're even discussing them today? Do they pose a serious risk? Um, and, you know, as I just um, outlined, they're not the same. So are the risks in uh, the same as well or not. Jordan, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, sure, so first you did a good job of explaining the difference between uh, TikTok and, and WeChat. Fundamentally, they're both uh, you know run and operated out of uh, Beijing for uh, TikTok and um, uh, Shenzhen for Tencent respectively. Um, the sort of level of international adoption of those two apps is very different. Um, you know, TikTok probably has a, over a billion users around the world at this point, and you know, cl uh, climbing close to 100 million uh, just in the U.S. alone. Um, WeChat's present in presence in America and around the world is much more limited to mostly uh, sort of Chinese diaspora and Chinese speakers, people doing business with folks in China. Um, it's, it hasn't sort of broken through like at the mainstream sort of communication level the way like WhatsApp has, um, you know, WhatsApp has taken over uh, the world when it comes to uh, sort of instant messaging communications. So the question then remains like, why was Trump focusing on this stuff in the first place? Um, there are, in my view, some legitimate uh, reasons for people to be concerned about uh, foreign or Chinese in particular, uh, uh, consumer facing software platforms uh, gaining very widespread adoption in the US and I'll be brief. Um, the first and the one that most um, concerns me has to do with sort of news shaping, election influence, um, all the sort of things that people worry about and get upset about when we're talking about sort of Google News, uh, you know, rankings or what shows up on your Facebook feed. Um, those issues are exactly the same when you're looking at a um, uh, a WeChat news feed or a, or a TikTok, whatever video is going to show up next, except the 
what you sort of have to trust is not only is 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 one level more complicated, right? Than just saying, okay, like Mark Zuckerberg, um, which Australia clearly has some uh, issues with uh, right now. Um, we're going to let you, uh, you know, decide what's going to be in front of our um, our citizenry when they, uh, you know, spend their thirty minutes trying to understand what's going on in the world. Um, the there's obviously sort of uh, political censorship that goes on on the domestic versions of all of these apps. And it's been made clear by the work of Aspie and Citizen Lab and others that there's um, some aggressive uh, uh, massaging of what shows up in feeds, uh, feeds abroad as well. So just briefly, the other concerns that people have, um, which maybe I'll leave my other panelists to talk to, uh, are with data privacy. Um, people are worried about kind of hacking issues and, and um, exposure to various, uh, you know, just like data privacy that you, you, you issues you'd have with any other platform um, are the two that seem to have struck the, those two issues, uh, sort of election news content, as well as data privacy are the two that seem to have uh, struck most of a nerve uh, in capitals around the world. Thanks uh, for that, Jordan. Um, Joanna, I'm going to th throw over to you next because you um, have followed um, both WeChat and TikTok in your reporting in Canada. Um, but uh, if, if I could ask you about WeChat first, um, uh, I, I, I would note um, to everyone watching that um, Joanna has helpfully tweeted out all the relevant articles that she has uh, written about um, these topics and it's pinned to the top of her Twitter feed. So anything that she um, goes on to mention, you can um, find the, the original source there. Um, so, but Joanna, what I'd like to um, understand from you is what has been the experience of WeChat users um, in Canada? And can you tell us about how the the news uh, that these WeChat users are receiving on the platform has had an effect on Canadian politics. Yeah, thank you. And I would say that I've traveled uh, for my book research to Australia and the US. So I find that the environment as, as far as how the diaspora around the world uses WeChat is quite similar in these countries. So I'm giving Canadian examples, but you might want to see if it's relevant in your home countries, which I think it largely is very applicable. So many Chinese Canadians uh, use WeChat to stay in touch with their friends and family, and often it's their best and perhaps only choice because um, Gmail, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, those apps are all blocked in China. Uh, you would need a VPN, reliable VPN to be able to use them. So in a way, it's kind of a, a connector to China and also information from China and all the entertainment you can find on WeChat, you know, Canadians of Chinese descent, um, more often immigrants or people from the mainland use WeChat a lot. And anecdotally, uh, when this ban came up, there was talk in Canada, should we do the same? And most Chinese Canadians seem to oppose a blanket ban because WeChat is such an integral part of their lives. When I lived in Beijing, um, I understood that because I spent hours on the app. Everything happened on the app. It's an, People call it an everything app. So what's interesting is that in Vancouver, I've seen it spill over into the political scene, um, both in positive and negative ways. Uh, for example, there is an independent journalist originally from Beijing, worked for reputable as, as reputable as you can get uh, independent media in Beijing. And in Vancouver, because of various issues um, like the United Front efforts to censor Chinese language reporting even when it's published in Canada by Canadians. Um, he has turned to WeChat as a Canadian citizen to self-publish some of his articles to reach um, the global, you know, Chinese reading uh, public as well as people in Canada specifically. And he writes critically about people, figures in Canada who seem to be doing the work of Beijing to support China's political goals. He has even been sued by local businessmen for defamation because of his uh, investigations. So, but that said, WeChat can be a forum for some public sharing of information that sometimes it gets through, even though it gets censored eventually. Um, but it's also a big source of misinformation in Canada. Uh, during the elections in 2018, my team at uh, the Vancouver Bureau of the Toronto Star found out that um, a 
society, the Wenzhou Friendship Society, um, with links to the Chinese government, was offering twenty dollars for people to vote to as a transportation subsidy for people to vote for certain Chinese Canadian candidates. Um, so they were um, investigated by the police for um, election uh, interference. So that's an example of uh, vulnerability because when many Chinese immigrants to Canada use this app and they may not be comfortable accessing English language media, um, they're very open to potential misinformation or disinformation that is shared widely in Canada on WeChat. Um, and lastly, an example I have in my upcoming book, China and Bound, is that WeChat is also a way for Chinese police to reach across the world to harass people. So I spoke with a student in my book who, who opened an anonymous Twitter account to retweet a few posts. Some of them were satirical, some of them um, were about Xi Jinping under a fake name. And as soon he suddenly got a call from WeChat without accepting police officers contact requests um, from a police officer back in his hometown in China harassing him, telling him to take down the Twitter post, saying, we know where you live in Canada, uh, we know where your family lives in China, and we, and they, when they harassed uh, parents in China. And throughout, they used uh, WeChat as a communication medium for this harassment. Um, while this harassment could have happened maybe without the presence of WeChat, if um, it was, say, through a phone line, maybe police could have done more to trace this call. Whereas WeChat, because of Chinese laws, has to comply with police investigations. Um, so there's a lot of elements at play, and Chris Parsons will probably go way more into detail on the security aspects of WeChat. But just to show that um, your location, being a WeChat user in Canada, is really not that much protection against both censorship and harassment that can be facilitated through this very uh, popular app. Thanks uh, for that, Joanna. And um, uh, as this um, recent ASPE report, the influence environment by some of my, some of my colleagues here um, makes very clear a lot of the, um, the problems that you were just outlining um, are not just apl applicable to Canada, but also to Australia. And I think it's perhaps um, in countries where there is a large Chinese uh, diaspora and where um, there is an over sort of a large representation, I should say, of, of, of uh, Chinese Australians in certain electorates, um, the power that WeChat has um, through their ability to control the news that, that these citizens receive can have quite a significant effect on um, political outcomes overall because of the electoral um, map and how that's made up. Um, but now let me uh, go on to uh, Christopher because um, uh, at Citizen Lab, um, you have done and you and your colleagues have done uh, really excellent groundbreaking work on um, essentially opening up the hood of WeChat and, and looking in uh, to determine to what extent there is censorship and surveillance taking place um, on that platform. I, I wonder if you could give the audience an idea of um, what that research has been and also importantly, how it has progressed and how it has perhaps changed your thinking about um, how censorship and surveillance takes place on, on WeChat. Yeah, so first, um, thank you for having me and for inviting the lab. And it's an honor to be uh, on a panel with such distinguished uh, colleagues. So the Citizen Lab has been involved in looking at Chinese social media applications for, for quite some time. And we've looked at WeChat as well as a series of others. And I think the first thing that is most apparent is that the initial processes of surveillance and censorship that we identified are becoming more complicated. And so we've seen processes of image analysis get better. We've seen processes of document analysis improve. And clearly we've seen processes within China of textual analysis also get incredibly sophisticated. 
So it's important to recognize that first, we've seen a technological shift over the course of our research. The other thing that we've been seeing and we've been monitoring and in particular my colleagues is the expanding uh, number of keywords and topics which are identified as sensitive within China. So a lot of the lab's work initially has really focused on what is occurring within China. We have a particular technical system that we've set up to try and run these tests. In 2020, however, we thought we'd push a theory a little bit. So the lab had sort of adopted an approach that I think was probably pretty commonly held by a lot of researchers that in the case of WeChat, there was one app and two systems. Um, and by that, it meant that you could use WeChat external to China. And if you hadn't registered your account within China, or the Chinese SIM, that you would be relatively free of both censorship and surveillance. So we pushed on that. Was it the case? And uh, one of my colleagues developed, a, a, or a pair of my colleagues developed a particularly ingenious test whereby two Canadian registered accounts would send data back and forth purely between themselves um, that would contain censored content. We would then uh, run a test to see if it was also censored with accounts uh, in China. If that was the case, then we would know that there was in fact surveillance being uh, undertaken on international accounts that had not been registered to China to develop and enable the Chinese censorship index. And that's what we found. And so that was, again, an, a demonstration that the surveillance capabilities of WeChat, um, if they hadn't grown, at least it was the first time that we'd noticed this. Now it's of course important to note that since we published our research, some of that seems to have receded. Um, whether or not there is a, a new technique that's being used by WeChat, if they've pulled back from now or something else, that'll be an area where we continue to conduct research. Now, the last question or the last part of your question was, what is going on with my own thinking and, and to some extent the lab's thinking on where this could go? So in addition to being quite curious about how audio surveillance may be conducted and audio censorship may be conducted, we're also curious and watching to see whether or not we see WeChat begin to move down uh, a pathway that we've seen other Chinese vendors move, move down. And in particular, companies like Huawei and others who are now selling surveillance equipment that was initially developed and sold into China to facilitate Chinese aims is now being sold to other countries. So there is a worry that we may see China, uh, WeChat, which you know perhaps is one, uh, one app, 1 1.5 systems at the moment, actually compress yet further in that another country um, could say, we want WeChat to be available in our country. However, we want to uh, take advantage of some of the surveillance and censorship capabilities in our jurisdiction as well. So that's definitely an area that we're watching for. It's, it's challenging um, to, to monitor comprehensively, of course, because uh, some of our technical testing requires uh, 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 devices registered around the world. But nonetheless, I think that is an area of um, emerging concern and, and interest. And it's definitely one of the areas that we're spending some time watching. I would just note the last thing in our own research um, is when we did find that surveillance was taking place internationally, we then uh, went through and analyzed all the public facing documents that WeChat had made available to try and figure out, can you read those documents and figure out that the surveillance was going on? And I would argue, in fact, you could not make that assessment. We also filed data access requests under Canadian privacy legislation, which in part was asked WeChat will you disclose that this is going on? And we got null responses to that question. I think what that indicates is there is uh, an important role to test how companies behave. And we now need to see regulators step up when it is clear that we're basically seeing compliance washing. We now need to see regulators step up and exert their own powers to compel companies to behave more appropriately when they're operating abroad. Um, thank you, Christopher. Um, Jordan, I want to throw back to you because um, Christopher was just outlining how um, with WeChat, um, there are users in mainland China and then there are users outside of main China and they're intermingling in the same ecosystem. And uh, as uh, Citizen Labs research has shown, um, there was originally a sense that there were it was one app with two different censorship systems, one for 
PRC based people and one for people outside of China. But as their more recent research has shown, um, some of the censorship and certainly surveillance has uh, uh, been targeted on people who live outside of China. Now, with TikTok, it seemed that ByteDance had figured out a way to bell the cat on this, and they made an early strategic decision to have the Chinese version of the app, Douyin, um, relegated to inside China, where China's stringent censorship rules would apply. And then with TikTok, um, at least theoretically, those same censorship uh, requirements would not uh, apply um, to, to that app um, and the foreign users of the app. Now, um, you were, as far as I can tell, the, the first um, analyst out there to raise the alarm about TikTok um, in foreign policy in January 2019. So what was it about TikTok and their uh, strategy um, that, you know, was so clear to you at that very early stage that, that it would indeed pose a problem? Well, thanks for the shout out, Fergus. I hope I do other things. Um, so if someone writes a obituary of me, I can talk about something besides TikTok and WeChat, but I will put this feather in my cap. Um, I think the, uh, the, the issue, um, which was sort of clear to me, was first off that this platform was gonna be a huge hit. I was uh, living in, in China at the time and a sort of obsessive user of Douyin and kind of saw the magic of the algorithm and, you know, was was fully expecting it to, to be one, um, uh, a, a real hit in the West. And I think there's sort of the logic, which uh, the, the logic is relatively straightforward, which is that even though, um, the company tried to sever the two um, uh, the, the two apps. At the end of the day, they were trying to create something which was sort of beyond politics, um, having like an apolitical kind of like happy place. Um, I think that the, the, the phrase, I forget the exact phrase in Chinese, but it was just like to showcase your beautiful life or something. Um, but in the West, that is untenable for a social media platform once it gets to a certain size. And the rubber clearly hit the road, I think, uh, during the Black Lives, uh, the start of the Black Lives Matter protests in the summer of 2020. Um, ByteDance was really confused and didn't really know what to do. At first it was banning um, conversation and hashtags about the, about the topic, um, you know, because the sort of value system and the, the knee-jerk reactions that they work under are ones which were owned and developed by running a platform within uh, within the PRC itself. So um, they banned it. Their users were up in arms. They said, you can't do this. Come on, this is our platform. We should be able to talk about politics. And eventually the platform gave in. And now you see videos um, saying Trump is great with a million, with a million uh, views and saying Trump is a terrible person with a million views. And it's become a sort of full... Uh, like copious universe of free speech, just like, uh, more or less, just like any other platform. So um, the concern, I guess, uh, which I had, which was that this was going to be a place where sort of real discourse was happening, not just people, you know, showing off their their cool new skateboard tricks or, um, or what have you. And that has come to pass. And now we're in a situation where, um, I think it's kind of inconceivable to think that viral videos criticizing uh, the the Chinese Communist Party could um, blow up on on TikTok. And you know the extent to which the you know, everyone sort of is aware about how powerful these algorithms are in shaping people and shaping public opinion. So the question I think still stands is to what extent are um, democratic countries around the world comfortable with this sort of um, censorship or not even censorship, but just kind of like guided eyeballs um, towards certain things and away from certain things uh, when the sort of buck stops, not necessarily at the GM in Canberra or, um, or Los Angeles, but uh, uh, at the end of the day in Beijing. Um, 
Lindsay, a, a question for you. Um, Jordan just uh, mentioned that, uh, you know, there, there could be a case of guided eyeballs on TikTok. In other words, the video content that's served up to people, um, we, you don't really know what um, is in the algorithm um, and what inputs are uh, deciding that those particular videos get served up to people. I wonder if you could give us your your thoughts on that. I mean, I've, I've heard some people say that detecting any manipulation uh, on TikTok would in fact be easy. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly in the work that we did for our uh, report here, TikTok and WeChat, um, we, we did find instances of blunt censorship. So for example, in Russia, uh, the hashtag um, Putin is a thief, which is often yelled out by opposition protesters on the streets, is shadow banned on the platform. Um, and similarly, when we looked at hashtag Xinjiang, uh, we found that curiously a lot of, um, frankly, propaganda, pro-Beijing propaganda, was pushed to the top of um, that hashtag uh, and uh, dissenting views were few and far between. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about, about that, the, diffi the difficulty of, of uh, ascertaining whether the, the blunt and obvious censorship that we, we definitely know was happening on TikTok thanks to many investigative reports. How are we gonna know if that's um, going to continue or is, is happening right now? So I think that's precisely the problem and, and why the the eventual Chinese ownership uh, is ultimately so concerning, because at least with the way social media platforms are structured today um, in countries like the United States, Canada and Australia, we don't have a good way of knowing how the algorithms are prioritizing content. And TikTok is notoriously opaque. But by the way, we also have similar problems with Facebook, with Twitter, um, with Google's YouTube. Uh, in, you know, in domestic contexts and also in the context of foreign interference, where you know, I think it's a very common, now very, very commonly understood that by prioritizing engagement um, on these big social media platforms, um, polarization has also been at the top of the queue when it comes to the content that's shown. Um, and in particular, conspiratorial content draws your eyeballs in and makes you makes you stay on the platform and say, wow, is the earth really uh, flat? And it's not, um, you always have to say. But so, so that, so, so the very sort of engagement driven metrics that are behind social media more generally because of the advertising business model, um, have created an environment where we don't have visibility into how algorithms by and large are prioritizing content. And there, you know, there's some discussion on algorithmic accountability and algorithmic transparency and questions about whether you could in fact set up some sort of regulatory scheme to if not access the intellectual property to know exactly how the secret sauce algorithm works, um, at least perform some basic tests on a right, an ongoing basis to say, that that certain allegations of bias or censorship um, are not occurring on the platform. But, you know, absent that regulatory framework, which I'm not even sure would be effective um, at, at tracking some of this, I think it's extremely difficult to understand beyond isolated incidences and research, uh, you know, like like the ones like the research that um, you at ASPE have done. Uh, really what's going on. And, and that's primarily the concern that instead of having these profit driven platforms that have perhaps their own concerns and um, their own questions as to you know whether they're promoting healthy democratic discourse in the United States and elsewhere, uh, instead of having profit driven platforms um, calling the shots and, and sort of behind the curtain guiding the eyeballs, um, you could have uh, an authoritarian government doing that. And the reason I think it's not a hypothetical concern at all, in addition to the, the examples that you mentioned, um, is that we know that the Chinese Communist Party is active in spreading information campaigns and information manipulation uh, across all three major US-owned social media platforms, um, Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, 
um, they're, they're heavily promoting certain views and trying to cast aspersions on others. Um, so the idea that as TikTok grows in popularity, uh, which it has, and, and I think a similar case could be made um, for WeChat, which this is already happening, um, as more and more political discourse takes place on a platform that, as Jordan mentioned, started out as this sort of happy place, um, you know, sharing lip syncs, and that's how most people still probably think of it. Um, but as more and more political conversation takes place on these platforms, I think it would be almost inconceivable to say that, well, the Chinese Communist Party is going to be active on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, but they're going to leave TikTok alone when they ultimately could potentially control some of those strings. Um, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I, I'm just noting the, the time and we're, we're quickly running out of it. Um, and after all, the, the name of this webinar is TikTok and WeChat, where to now? So I think now I'll just throw over to all the panelists um, uh, and feel free to just um, to chime in whenever you like on where we're heading now, uh, I guess there are two parts to that question. Where should we head to? What what are the policy options available after the roller coaster ride that we've all been on? Um, and also, perhaps, um, where do you think it's like we're likely to uh, to head towards? Um, particularly with the um, the new Biden administration, but also as part of this question. Um, uh, we need to make clear, you know, what can the United States do? And then what can middle powers like Canada and Australia do? And, and how can we perhaps work together on, on these issues? So um, maybe I'll throw it to you first, um, Christopher, and we'll go, we'll go down the line. And then we will, um, of course, have to... Um, we will uh, take questions from the audience as well. Yeah, that is really the question, where to go next? Um, and I think that it's helpful to keep in mind that we, we are dealing with uh, concerns and questions around TikTok and WeChat, but we also have pretty prominent concerns around existing Western social media. And so at least in the Canadian context, I think that where we're starting to go or where I would hope we would go is slowly, gradually, and persistently to understand what the actual problem is and collect information. So the Citizen Lab, along with you know, any number of researchers and research labs, are really trying to correct information asymmetries right now. What is being done on these applications? When are things moderated? What aren't they moderated? What are the terms of moderation, censorship, and disclosure to law enforcement, and so on and so forth? So I, I can speak for um, the, the lab's position where we are hoping to see some changes, both in Canada, but ideally um, we'll see similar positions uh, communicated in other parliamentary systems um, amongst the Five Eyes and then more broadly um, with uh, our friends and allies around the world. So just to give you an idea of a few of the things that would be helpful initial starting points. First, we could just require companies to publish their content moderation guidelines that explain what exactly moderators do in assessing content that stays up and down, where those moderators are located, and the relationship between algorithmic tools and human tools to assess it. This would give us some insight as to how content moderation operates, as well as when and how often new moderation topics or terms are introduced by companies. Second, companies could be required to publish guidelines that explain um, how platforms themselves are subject to state surveillance and, if relevant, censorship. And here they should be clear, this example of content offends this part of the law and thus we do this. So to understand how companies themselves are interpreting the laws in the jurisdictions where they operate. Now, that would be a heavy cost for, for global companies, but this is one of the costs, I think, of being a global company. Third, they should be required to publish their government agency security and access guidelines. So explaining the terms under which these companies have set up for when government agencies can come to them, be they in their domestic uh, uh, home country, so in the case of TikTok in China, the, the Chinese government, but also how they respond to foreign requests. How, how often um, do they expect to receive them? How will they process them? What due process, if any, is provided? Fourth, 
companies should be required to publish transparency reports, with, which explain how often government agencies come and request data, under what terms, and what regularity is it disclosed. Um, and in particular, whether there are certain classes or types of data that are being requested. So this could be uh, capturing whether political information is the motivator for these requests, or whether it pertains to sexual freedoms or foreign affairs or, or other matters. Fifth, we recommend that at um, a government request and to government auditors or, or in a privileged environment, organizations should be required to make their algorithms available when governments have reason to believe that uh, those algorithms are being used to either facilitate influence operations in their jurisdiction, or they're otherwise being used to influence or interfere with that country's uh, either domestic or international relations. So, you know, should TikTok's algorithms seem to be upsetting the way that Canada can operate, then the Canadian government should be able to gain access to those algorithms. And then finally, organizations should have to disclose whether and under what conditions they share information um, amongst their subsidiaries and their headquarters when any of those parties happen to be in uh, jurisdictions that have a low uh, rule of law or are known to violate human rights or have undue or inappropriate privacy protections. Now, none of that solves the fundamental problem, but it actually would give us data to better appreciate and understand what these companies are doing, why they do it, under what conditions, and then from there, ideally, we would be in a position to better engage in evidence-based policymaking. Thank you, Christopher. That's a very comprehensive list uh, of things that we um, could be looking at in terms of policy options. Lindsay, I'll go to you next, um, because I know that you've written about this and you, you also touch on uh, the need for allies to, to work together on these issues as well. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great list. Um, I think you know one of the one of the struggles this in this issue, particularly in the United States, is that we don't really have a we, we don't have at all a federal data protection or data privacy framework that we could draw on in the way that many countries in Europe have done to investigate. You know, particularly with TikTok, some of the data sharing practices. Um, and actually, I think it was the Washington Post that discovered that, you know, in, in sort of contravention of the agreement that TikTok had with the the um, Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, TikTok was actually sending unique identifiers for advertising back to China, um, uh, you know, despite those policies. So I think there's also a question of, of even, even if we had sort of this kind of country neutral framework, which I, which I, I absolutely take um, Christopher's point that this, these transparency requirements uh, would would really better understand the problem. There is still this question of would you really be able to understand the influence? And so one of the things that um, I've recommended and um, you know think is worth consideration is to sort of convene um, multi multilaterally on an understanding of these threats and an understanding of some of um, so sort of some of what Christopher proposed in terms of uh, you know understanding what's really happening on these platforms and you know one model that could be could be helpful in this context is when when the United States a couple of years ago was raising concerns um, over over Huawei's influence um, in 5G networks uh, another sort of element of the information architecture. Um, they convened a multilateral conference in Prague called the Prague Security Conference on 5G Networks. And their um, democracies developed principles, risk-based principles for, for what vendors, uh, you know, vendor neutral framework for um, allowing, allowing companies to operate, own and operate 5G networks. And I think that helped really build an understanding of the problem um, and part of it was was there was included a political dimension to to this risk-based framework and in particular um the rule of law status in in a particular country from which this technology was coming so i, I think a similar concept could be applied to this this content layer of the the information environment where countries get together to understand what what the real threats are and develop some principles for how how platforms that potentially are owned by the Chinese Communist Party or or, or 
connected companies um, or companies from other authoritarian governments should be operating within democracies. Um, because part of the tension here that we haven't touched on really yet is that there is an inherent asymmetry in the information space between democracies and autocracies. Democracies thrive on open information. They promote an open information environment, uh, universal rights. Authoritarians um, are promoting a cyber sovereignty model that says we can tr we can control the information environment within our own borders, um, and you know what you say could be censored. Uh, so these are these are models that are very at odds, and so they're. It's a complication, I think, that the United States went through over the last year to try to figure out, well, how do we how do we respond so that autocracies are not going to weaponize and exploit the openness that really typifies democratic systems, particularly around information, um, but at the same time adhere to those very principles and not become closed off um, ourselves. And so, so, you know, some would argue that actions like a unilateral ban of of these apps could be seen as a, as a somewhat autocratic move that sort of belies the principles of, of openness of communication and the ability um, to express one's views. Um, so, and, and so I think that multilateralism can actually be a, a strong counter to that. If a number of democracies feel that, you know, if, if a platform can't adhere to these basic requirements of transparency, say, of, of freedom from foreign influence and prove that, then then perhaps you could conclude that that should not be um, operating in a democracy. But I think doing that in a unilateral way exposes countries to criticism, criticisms of sort of autocratic tendencies and actions that ultimately don't advance their own values. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, and uh, included in your answer there, I think, was a, a, a good answer to a question posed by Jared Gibney in the um, in the in the question uh, thread here, who asks, as insecurity over data increases due to a globalized market, will we see a trend towards intensified segmenting of the internet into blocks, i.e., democratic versus uh, authoritarian? And um, uh, but Joanna, um, let me throw it to you now um, that. Christopher and Lindsay have already provided a, a very comprehensive list of, um, of a sort of a roadmap forward. Um, is there anything that, that you would add to that list? Yeah, so um, I'm not a security expert like Christopher and Lindsay and they are, their policy suggestions are so comprehensive, I can't really add to that. Um, but I think I could add kind of like a human element to it because I think when we talk about tech and security on apps, we kind of imagine like the average user in the US, Canada, Australia, which involves people from all sorts of uh, ethnic backgrounds. But when it comes to people who are really truly at risk, their physical safety um, and their risk of just targeted harassment, um, it's people of the Chinese diaspora. It's people from Hong Kong, Taiwan, mainland China, who are most likely to be targeted by Chinese police um, to might even face extraterritorial kidnappings or um, illegal interrogations when they visit China or any type of um, territory that might have an extradition agreement with China. So we've seen people like Hong Kong booksellers get picked up in Thailand and then shipped somehow and show up uh, next thing you know in a Chinese prison and giving a false, giving a confession on TV to, to crimes. Um, so like people like me, because I was born in Hong Kong, so therefore the Chinese government doesn't recognize <laughs> dual citizenship. And basically, if you look Chinese, your name's Chinese, especially if you were born on Chinese territory, you are Chinese. Um, so I think the general public needs to be aware that the stakes is not that um, as a Canadian, the Chinese government could be reading my text and that's an invasion of privacy that I feel uncomfortable with. Uh, it could be that they're trying to find evidence of me uh, criticizing the state so that they could create some sort of um, file and justification for um, actual persecution, like people um, living overseas uh, facing charges in China or their families being harassed because as people being based overseas are using these platforms to try to reach the Chinese users on there to, 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 to express themselves. Um, and they have more leverage when family members, relatives, friends are in, are, are in Chinese territory. So that's something that um, regulators and policymakers kind of have to keep in mind that it's not just this is an invasion of privacy and surveillance. It's 
these people are at risk and they have been targeted in the past. They've been uh, targeted through WeChat and TikTok in the past. Um, and also, um, as far as the different expert recommendations, what I found personally compelling was that the more effective ones would have to apply to all companies, all social media companies, not just Chinese ones or not just ones who use Chinese technology. Because for example, Clubhouse, which has been making the rounds and all these debates about security on the app, it's a Silicon Valley American company. Um, but we found that uh, Chinese users, um, they're concerned that they're being listened to, monitored, and what they say on the app could be used against them by Chinese authorities. So if we, if governments only made regulations targeting Chinese companies and not a company like Clubhouse, um, they're not going to capture all the different concerns, um, which can take place anywhere. It takes place on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, there's been many cases in China where, say, there is a crackdown on Twitter. So uh, outspoken uh, dissidents, human rights lawyers, Chinese academics, who once uh, years ago uh, tweeted on on Chinese politics, those tweets would be would come up as part of um, like the prosecution's cases against them for crimes like uh, endangering national security or stirring up trouble. These are very common crimes that people in China um, are uh, accused of. Um, and it doesn't matter, it's, it's Twitter, it's an American app. So these kind of questions about policies, I think it makes sense for them to be applied universally. So if it's a country like Canada, that they would update their cyber security policy, not just focusing on certain countries or authoritarian countries, but but any type of um, online platform. Thanks, Joanna. That's, that's a really excellent point. Um, we are really coming up on the hour now. So Jordan, I'll, I'll give you the, the final word. And uh, let's see if you can also handle uh, the the most upvoted question that we have, which is from James Kell, artificial intelligence is fueled by data points. TikTok, WeChat provides thousands of data points directly to the CCP. The CCP therefore most likely knows much more behavioral data about young Australians than Australia's own government. Isn't that a big problem? So I'll, I'll just lob that to you as well as see if you have any other ideas for how we're going to solve this problem. And then, then I'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, thanks for that one, James. It's tricky. Uh, you know, you can come up with some inventive uh, ideas for what can be done with all of that data. Uh, you know, the most obvious one is figuring out how to sell people stuff. Uh, which is what uh, TikTok, which is what Facebook has been doing for a long time and what TikTok is trying to do nowadays. Um, there are other concerns, uh, sort of more on the like high tech side of being able to do like uh, take people's voice samples and, and create like AI versions of their voice and then do sort of crazy espionage with that. I'm not super concerned on that front. Um, I, I, my my sense is that like if if people want that sort of data, um, it's not it's not incredibly hard to scrape people's Facebook pages. Um, and if you're a sort of adversary trying to um, do espionage, you don't necessarily need um, the likes of a giant platform installing everyone's phones to make that sort of thing happen. Even though it does probably lower the um, lower the sort of cost per hack, I guess. Um, what to do? It's a really hard question. I am a little more pessimistic than uh, uh, than Chris and Lindsay about sort of finding a middle ground um, between uh, cutting these platforms off entirely and um, sort of letting them letting them go about their their merry way. I think fundamentally there is an issue of trust um, where you know the companies can say, "Here's our algorithm," and yeah, here's here are all our guidelines, um, but there's there's no way a government like the the amount you would have to open source in order to um, make everyone comfortable that uh, not everything is going nothing is going on above board I think is a very tall order for these companies to basically write rewrite their entire code bases in a way that um, you know a, I guess select body of uh, uh, you know a council of technical elders can peek in at will so. Um, I, 
it, it seems like the sort of the, the the Chris and Lindsay view on this sort of thing is 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 more dominant is 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 on the ascendancy in uh, democratic capitals around the world. Um, but I think the country, the, the, the leadership in these countries are gonna har find that it's gonna be a really hard road to hoe in getting the sort of confidence and security that they want um, and sort of answer the questions that they're, they're hoping to of a platform which isn't, uh, which isn't based in the US or based, based outside of China. All right, well, on that uh, optimistic note, um, let me take this opportunity to once again thank all of these wonderful experts who have joined us today. I really feel like we've got the, the dream team um, assembled today. Certainly, I've been following all of your work very closely and it has, has helped in, inform the work that we're doing here um, at ASPE. Um, and so I would um, encourage everyone to, um, to follow the work of all the panelists tonight, as well as take a look at uh, the two reports uh, that ASPE have done recently on these topics. Um, and let me finally say that we will be relaunching our Mapping China's Tech Giants website, website in April. And both ByteDance and Tencent, the companies that own and operate TikTok and WeChat, will be featured on that website, as well as a number of new um, Chinese tech companies. Um, but uh, with that, um, let me just uh, bid uh, adieu to everyone. And once again, thank these wonderful uh, experts for joining us and for everyone for tuning in. Bye for now.